The Dice Tower is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. This episode is sponsored by The Op, also known as USAopoly. The Dice Tower, episode 668, Belleville. Welcome to The Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. In today's show, Tom Vassell joins us woo, to talk about some games that we've been playing. We'll chat a little digital gaming, and we will wrap up with a game pie all about desserts. I'm Suzanne Sheldon. And I'm Mandy Hutchinson. I'm eating pie. <laughs> Are you really? No, but I want to now, and I know where some pie is. I could find oh. it. But you I, are. I, 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 I'm really striving not to eat pie. Um, so. Why? <laughs> why? Because <laughs> they have yet to make an amazing pie that is also calorie, calorie uh, less. <laughs> Fair point. <laughs> Alas. Oh, that, that health thing. Oh, well. Well, it's funny. Recently, I was just talking to my mom about COVID bodies. Don't laugh, but it's a thing because you're not, you know, walking around and doing the things. You're not at conventions, working off the calories. So I, you know, do my own home workouts and becoming comfortable with the COVID look. I think it's, it's working out well for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome everybody to another episode of the Dice Tower podcast. You will note that our dear friend Tom is here breaking away from Eric and joining us for an episode. Tom, thank you so much for being here on our week of Gen Con episode. It's very rare to be here. I was I was telling uh, people today that I normally, right now, I would be in a bit of a panic getting packed and knowing I'm going to be out for a week and having everything done. And I'm kind of just sitting here going, huh, not doing that this year. Yeah, I mean, in years past, we've done a Gen Con preview show, but it just felt a little wonky this year. Well, well, what publishers have done, and I'm actually glad for this, is they're spreading everything out. There's going to be some stuff released around Gen Time, Gen Con, but the Gen Con slash Essen releases are kind of merging. Some stuff that was is being released, quote unquote, at Essen, you're going to be able to get copies of quite soon. And some things that were being released now will come out next month. And so for those people who get overwhelmed by the tsunami of new releases at a convention, good news, it's a little bit more spread out this year. Do you think that that means that there's less excitement for Gen Con this year beyond just moving it to digital because there's fewer kind of massive glut? Or do you think it's going to be everybody's just dealing with kind of the transition into the online and that's that's enough to deal with in one one moment. Well, sure. I mean, there's going to be the negative. I mean, you. I'm sorry. I don't care how excited you are for an online con. It's just not going to be the same sense. You're not seeing your friends. You're not there picking up the energy from other people. I, I mean, it, it, there's exciting things. Fantasy Flight is announcing stuff. We don't know what it is yet. But there's not a... I don't know. You know where they roll the dice and everybody runs in the hall? You can't do that necessarily on an online con. I could sit there and click really fast and say, I'm not running, <laughs> you know. Um, and, you know, what I loved about, about Gen Con is you walk down the, the different hallways and things and you turn a corner and you see something. You're like, wow, I wasn't expecting to see that, a game or whatever. Or someone in cool cosplay. Online, you're not going to have that discovery as much. You actually have to kind of know what you're doing, if that makes sure. sense. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, I think this will bring in new people maybe for Gen Con online because there are a lot of people that didn't attend Gen Con, right? Because it was overwhelming. So maybe the online way will kind of bring new people in that way. And then when it does happen again, maybe they'll take the chance and actually go to the convention. I don't know. Something to think about. I've heard a lot of people who self-claim to be introverts say they like online cons better. It's m more accessible for them. Mm. Um, I don't know if it would be a transition or not, though. Mm. I don't know. We'll have to, we won't know till the future, but it's what we have at this point in time. And so, Gen Con. And Gen Can't. Yeah. I set you up there. <laughs> you did so well. Threw Thank that you. Softball much, across uh, the plate. much better than I would do. So, kudos. Pop right out of the ballpark. 
because, yeah, Gen Cant is happening again, and I'm pretty excited about it this year because a lot of content creators have stepped up to host even more games. And really what Gen Cant is about, like Gen Con Online is going to be great. The publishers are holding demos. People will get to see, to your point, Tom, the games that are being released, they're going to get to demo those and hear about what news the publishers have. Gen Cant takes kind of a different angle and is much more focused on just actual gaming interaction and gaming activities. It's not about what is new per se. It's not about sales at all. It's just about playing games and talking with gamers. So we have a bunch of different things going on. Crystal Pisano is going to be hosting a Gen Cant karaoke night and a Gen Cant Jackbox game night. Mandy and our friend Ashley are going to be hosting an interactive play of the Roland Wright game Demeter that we just reviewed in a previous episode. And that's a game where Mandy and, and Ashley, you're going to host it, but then anybody can download the sheet and just play at home with them. So we can have literally hundreds of people playing the game together at the same time. So we've got a ton of great stuff planned for Gen Cant. I know the Gen Con team and all the publishers have worked really hard to bring some of that Gen Con awesomeness out to the digital sphere with their online experiences. So I really hope everybody out there checks it out, whether it's Gen Con or Gen Cant. Hey, it's one of those rare years where everybody could do both. And that's great uh, because it's ultimately all gaming goodness. Speaking of gaming goodness, I think we've all got games to talk about, so let's get to it. Brought to you by the Op Games, also known as USAopoly. The makers of Telestrations brings a new twist on the telephone game with Telestrations Upside Drawn. Players pair off into teams with one player acting as the clue master and moves the board and gives commands of up and down, while the second player holds the dry erase marker and tries to guess the word or phrase. It's a race to guess the words and phrases, and the first to reach 20 points wins. It's for 4 to 12 players, ages 12 and up, and plays in approximately 20 minutes. Available at the op.games or at your favorite game retailer. So, what have you been playing lately? I got a big one today, big game. I feel like I've been talking about like little bitty games, but I have a big one today. Now, I haven't played the actual physical copy of it. I don't even know if it exists yet, but I have played it. On well, we know it exists because... But I mean, Tom. like the physical... Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's true. Well, I'm not Tom. I'm not special. So I just have to play it on Tabletopia. <laughs> <laughs> for now. It was actually on Tabletopia fairly early. Um, that's one thing I like a lot of, because of what's going on now, some stuff's getting on there pretty fast. Mm-hmm. Which is great for the current situation. So I was really happy to get Tekenu, Obelisk of the Sun, to the virtual table. This is designed by Danielle Tassini and David Tursi. Art is by Jakub Fajdanowski, Mihal Dlujgaz, and Spiegniew Umgelter. It's published by Board and Dice, Giant Rock, and Raw Stone. I don't know when it's available. I think soon. Do you know, Suzanne, off the hand? Or Tom, do you know when if it's available soon? I think a few copies are going to be available through Gen Con and the rest coming out a few months later. That is what I believe is true, but I'm just making that up. Okay, so all you know, for everybody else, it's probably going to be a pre-order for the time being. So that's where we're at with that July 30th. July 30th. Okay, so it's like super, super soon. All right, so there you go. Uh, This game, I guess action drafting would be the best way to describe it. So if you're familiar with Teotihuacan, I believe it's in the kind of same realm of that type of game. In this game, though, you have this really cool obelisk that's in the center of the board, and it divides it out in sections, and this is what's kind of guiding where dice are going to go to help you take actions in the game. I got to learn about a few gods in the game, Horus, Ra, Hathor, Bastet, there are a few others, which I... Sadly, didn't know all of them, but these are going to signify different action spaces on the board. Um, 
the main part of the board is really important because that's where all of your dice are going. And this is where you're going to be taking said dice to complete actions on the board. And you want to make sure you're keeping your scales, because you have a player board with scales, even. So you can't just randomly willy-nilly take dice. You want to take ones that are going to keep things even or you're going to lose points on a track, uh, which we don't want, right? We want lots of victory points. A, good, a thing about a game you'll know when you start at 10 points in a game you know, yeah. <laughs> there are many ways that you can lose points. So, you know, it always makes me nervous, <laughs> right? You're like, oh, great. Where am I going to lose points? Uh, so the game and I don't remember exactly mathematically how many rounds there were, but there are two scoring periods in the game. And after the second scoring period, you do a final scoring in the game will end. Uh, this game, I think, took about three to four hours to play for our first session, bearing in mind it's done virtually, which does add some time. I liked this game a lot, like a lot, a lot. Uh, I had played uh, Teotihuacan, City of Gods, and I enjoyed it, but I think I liked this one better. <laughs> so I know Suzanne also played it, so I'm curious to hear what she thought about it. I do feel in this game you can't ignore certain areas. So uh, I, I think during the game I tried to avoid, there's an area on the board where you can get these cards which give you abilities, and I was like, oh yeah, maybe I'll do a little bit of that. But I kind of ignored it, and I find it's really important. <gasps> I know, it's so good. I know. And so my second game, I was like, I need to get some of these, and it opened up a whole new way of playing the game for me. So I do find in this game, which I like, you kind of have to touch on a few things. I don't know if you all agree with that thought or not, but I do find that my, made my gameplay better. For me, this intuitively felt easier than to, to walk on. I don't know what it is. My brain just couldn't quite attach to certain things in the game. Like I was, it, it seemed like it would go together for me, but it didn't. I had a really hard time with it. So I did find this one had a nice flow. It's longer, didn't feel long to me. I really, I didn't feel it, but maybe I was just enjoying myself so much I didn't notice. So overall, I liked this one. I don't know. What do you all think? There's fewer actions than the other one. You're only taking, what, 16 dice over the course of the game, I believe? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Which is, yeah, I guess so. Makes a difference. I'd have to play it more, but I like the first unpronounceable one better. Oh, you do? Okay, that's interesting. Zulkin? Or no, not Zulkin. <laughs> Teotihuacan? Teotihuacan. Yes, that one. Yeah. Um, but I do, I, I think I'm really enamored with the dice movement aspect Mm -hmm. That one feels like I have a whole lot of cool choices. This one's good. This one's good. But this one's all about balance. And I'm more about just get lots of cool things. They're, ah, they're both really good. But I think I'd, I don't I don't know. Probably this. Teotihuacan. <laughs> yes, that one. <laughs> that one. Okay. I'm just curious. Yeah. What about you, Suzanne? For me, I'm, I'm with you on this one. To, can you just really caught my fancy. I've thoroughly enjoyed my plays of it. My first play was an absolute fiasco. Oh, my good gravy. <laughs> that score was so low. It was humiliating. But after I got into the flow of it, and for sure following plays were much, much better. Similar to you, Mandy, I've only played mm -hmm. on, on Tabletopia, the digital version. The one thing I'll say, and you mentioned it, and it's one thing I've, because we were playing so many games on Tabletop Simulator and Tabletopia and digitally right now, boy, there is a time tax that these systems mm -hmm. really do add. Even the strong implementations, things that are simple in real life just takes so much extra time, especially in a heavier game like this. Cumulatively, you are just adding time just to work through the mechanics of the program itself. It's not the game's fault. It's not even really the program's fault. It's just the situation we're in. So I think all of my games have been a minimum of three hours. Yeah. And I really wonder how much of that. I, next time I play, I'm going to time it. I'm just going to figure out a way to kind of figure out how much extra effort it takes. Mm -hmm. Or Tom, I don't know, if, if if you've played in physical, let me know. Once you know the rules and you play it in real life, are you at two hours? Are you at 90 right. minutes? Or are you at three hours it's, like I am digitally? It feels like a two-hour game. Um, man, it's tough. It's because there's some really slow-moving decisions in it. And you... You don't want to make a mistake in this game. The one thing about this game that I'm not sure I like, I like, I like it a lot. Okay, mm -hmm. I think it's a great game. I, you could take a die and use it for resources, mm -hmm. and that feels like such a lackluster turn compared to <laughs> not using it for resources. Anything else, you know, you're taking this action, and I'm spending this, and building this, and doing right. that, and I'll be like, I'll take three rock. <laughs> I feel like it's like a volley. Do you know what I mean? It's like that, oh, let me get it ready for you. Then bam, spike for that next turn because you have all your resources to do the cool thing. Well, sure. But still, when someone else takes two longer turns in a row, it's kind of like, 
Bye. That's true. <laughs> there you go. To Ken you. <laughs> Up for me is a game called Mini Express. And I will say, I don't love the title. Mm. Mini Express is a lighter, and it's all relative, right? Because a lot of people say train games, and you think 18xx with train games. So I'm going to say Mini Express is a lighter train or stock game. It's designed by Mark Garrett, and it's being published by Mo Ideas, which is a publisher out of Taiwan. Other games Mark Garrett's have done are Mini Rails. So you can see Mini Express, Mini Rails. They've got a thing going on there, got which it. is another I- little game I loved. And steamrollers which is one of my <gasps> personal favorite yeah so good games. Yeah, that's be- right <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you do like that one tom steamrollers that's in my top five easy yeah it's i good. love steamrollers so good i love it uh, but i hate mini rails oh so so it evens out <laughs> oh well i like mini rails anyway uh <laughs> mini express is that s- stock thing you're gonna get a board with a big map on it and a bunch of trains there's a couple of there's some tracks that you're gonna do this there's different companies, right? Because in train games, it's all about managing rail companies. On your turn, you just have two actions you get to pick from. You can either take a stock from a company or you can place trains on the board. And there's all these different hexes and some have cities on them and some are blank. When you take a stock, you just take a little little cardboard token. But in that area, there's going to be some number of trains associated with that company. So if I take the, and of course there's theme to all of this that I've completely forgotten. So if you take one of the brown stocks and there's two brown trains, you are going to have to lose two influence in the brown company in order to take that stock. So taking stock, you lose power in that company and you have to rebuild it, which is automatically an interesting choice there. Right. And then after you take the stock, then you actually add more trains to that company because your other action is placing trains on the board. When you place trains, you can you are limited to the trains that are available in that little pool above the stock tokens. So if there's only two trains there. Guess what? You can at max place two trains. If there's five trains there, you can place five. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to be placing these little trains across the hexes all over the board trying to get to, you connect a city. When you go to that city, there's going to be a resource token on it. You're going to gain influence in those colors. So that's how I get that influence back that I lost. So, ooh, I took a brown stock. I lost two influences. But now I'm going to land in a city where I start to gain some brown influence back. Great. And then the company will actually advance. Hey, look, you put all these trains out. Depending on how many trains you put out into empty hexes, that company's value is going to go up. And this is all very normal stuff for anybody who's familiar with train games. Kind of that push and pull of stock values and company values and things like that. Ultimately, what you're trying to do is get a lot of influence in the rails and get those rail companies to have a good value. Because at the end of the game, your score is going to be based on where you are in the influence track against where that train company is. So, Mandy, if you're first in the brown train line, you're going to get seven points for brown. And then, Tom, if you're second in the brown train line, you're going to get five points for your brown stocks. That kind of thing. And if I'm third, I get like some kind of pity points with like a point per stock or something like that. I love pity points. (laughs) It's got, yes, it's, and boy, oh boy, you feel it when you get them in this game. This is another hit. Now, maybe I'm just a Mark Garrett's fan. That may be true because I also really enjoy Mini Rails. It sounds like Tommy did. I love Steamrollers as well. Mini Express is a hit for me. There is, in such simple mechanisms, a lot of challenging decisions that you have to make as you're trying to work the timing of when you take your actions. You're really monitoring how your influence is going, especially end game. Granted, it can maybe slow down a little as you're trying to think things through and really calculate where your optimal positioning is. But I love games that have a simple rule set, but give you some really deep thinking and deep gameplay. And Mini Express feels like that all in a game that really will play in an hour. It's not a long game, but it feels satisfying. Now, uh, this one is not quite available on market. I think they had a Kickstarter, but it is available to play on Tabletopia. 
Maybe a little bit of fiddliness is my biggest complaint about this one, but overall, for the sim simple rule set, for the speed of play, and for the satisfying nature of the depth of gameplay, I thoroughly enjoy Mini Express. One of my concerns with things like this is the confusion. Like you said, Mini Express, Mini Rails. Yeah. I hear a review like this, I go to the store, I don't know which one I'm getting. Mm. Yep. I have to really pay attention. And I, I was looking at the pictures of this as you were talking about it, and it doesn't look different than other train games. I mean, I'm assuming it probably is, as you said. It just it looks very similar, and so I just think it's easy to get them confused, that's all. Absolutely agree with you, Tom, and that's why I said I don't love the name of this game. It's a little generic, and it doesn't stand out. It, it does, the express, I would say, is true, especially in that world of train games. This plays quickly in context. But uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think we've had these discussions about things like games that have the same setting and every game has that setting in its <laughs> title. I would have called it Tiny Epic Express myself, but <laughs> whatever. <laughs> you might run into an issue with that one. <laughs> Gamelin might have had an issue with that one. But <laughs> all righty. Well, let me talk about Pandemic Legacy Season Zero. I'm, I can't. Hang on. In two weeks. Two weeks. Actually, no, wait. Three weeks, maybe. Okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You can't talk. Can you, have, you, have you finished it? Uh, as of a few hours ago, yes. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I can tell you offline. All right, but <laughs> instead, let me talk about a loser. No, oh. I'm not. It's not a loser game. Oh, it just no. it just lost to Spiel des Jahres. That's all. Oh, to oh the, my goodness. I, I was, was like, say, is it a stinker? I was like, what's happening? Okay, so I'm talking about My City. This is designed by Reiner Knizia um, uh, from Thames and Cosmos. This was this is a legacy game. It was nominated for Spiel des Jahres. I, I actually thought it was going to win, mm -hmm. and it did not. Pictures won instead. And if you want to play the inferior party game Pictures, go do so. But let's talk about My City. No, <laughs> Pictures is... No, I don't actually like Pictures, but... <laughs> <laughs> judges can pick what they want. My city, I you haven't played this yet, Suzanne. I don't believe, but I think you would like it. Oh, I'm so excited to play this. I have not played it, but I I've got a copy, and I'm I'm so excited for it. Yeah, because it's essentially a flip and write game. It's it's not quite, but that's what it is. You flip a card uh, over the the this game, and you will you off a bunch of the same buildings, different buildings and different Tetris shapes. You flip a card. Everyone has to put that building in their grid, their city grid somehow. And you just keep doing that. And this is a legacy game because it just keeps adding rules. I believe it's 30 games. Maybe it's 30. Yeah, it's 30 games, I believe, that you play. And it slightly changes the rules each game. And you put some stickers on your board if you win. You make your board a little worse. If you lose, you make your board a little better. And then other things will come and change your game. But it's essentially the same thing. You flip cards. You put these out there. I feel like it didn't necessarily need to be legacy. Mm. Like, I would have been happy if this had just been a base game with a bunch of modules in it. Mm -hmm. And you throw them in and out. But, eh, you know, it's also a good legacy game for people who've never played one before. It's excellent in that regard. It's not the prettiest game out there. It looks like it's a 90s game, probably. Um, but I enjoyed it. I have a lot of fun with the... I like the concept of saying, you better flip that four square red that I need that right now. Flip it, flip it, flip it. And then it doesn't flip, you know, but uh, everyone, I guess, could copy each other on in like game one, although game two, you're going to have stickers. So your boards are different, but in game one, but you just don't, everyone just does something different. I look at someone else's board and wow, wow that's completely different than what I did. Yeah. And I think that's true of a lot of the Roland Wright games that are multiplayer solitaire or have that element where you're all playing off of the same role or the same flip. And, you know, if, if you're the type of person that's going to look over at somebody else and just copies what they do, <laughs> I mean, okay. But I think you're missing the point. I'm not saying I've done that. I, I just... Uh... Mm. Called out. <laughs> now, Tom, can you play it? Once you're done through woo, 30 games or what, whatnot, what do you end up with? Have you just had a great experience that you reminisce over? It's not a very playable game on the legacy side, but they, they have an eternal city game, whatever, that they have on the one side. And that game, you need to play through the legacy games one through five to be able to play it, to understand all the rules for it. 
Oh, and then it's just available. So you do, even though it's not necessarily the legacy element, you still have a fully playable game for eternity on yes. like the other side of the board? Yes. My only concern with that is I feel like after playing through the legacy and all the cool, interesting things that happened there, you will go back to that and go, oh. Not as exciting, but it is replayable from that end out. And you could even play that end, honestly, without having done much else. It's, it's, it's really a very basic version of the game, but it does exist. So this game is technically replayable forever. Cool. I'm, I'm very excited to try this one. That's my city, the game which should have won the Spiel des Jahres in 2020. <laughs> well, I'm going to jump in with uh, something I guess we're going down a different road with a game called Fort. I think this was originally a game called SPQF, but they've since streamlined it and named it Fort. And this is designed by Grant Rodiek. Art is by Kyle Farron, and it's published by Leader Games. Uh, plays in about 20 to 40 minutes, two to four players, and I think it's around $30. Yep. I think that's right. Okay. And I don't know. I think it's on pre-order or coming soon, but I think you can order this one currently if that's, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And it will be available on Tabletop Simulator very soon. So keep your eye out for that because uh, now's a good time to be playing it online. Uh, so it's a deck building and hand management type game. And the theme, well, you're a kid and you want to hang out, get lots of friends, have some pizza, nom, 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 play with toys and build a cool <laughs> fort. <laughs> Come on. That's how you eat pizza, right? Nom, 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 nom. Yeah, that, <laughs> yes, that's how I eat pizza. <laughs> In the game, I know, by doing all of the things I just talked about, eating pizzas, getting your toys, you're going to get points, right? Especially the fort. And I, I have to say that because I neglected to build a very good fort. And let's be honest, that's what gets you lots of points in this game. So you start off the game with a couple of best friends. They got some stars on their cars to let you know, hey, we're besties. And you have an area where you have a yard, and this is where other players potentially can, you know, say, hey, come over to my yard. It's much better. So we don't want that. So in the game, there are a few phases that happen. You know, you have a cleanup phase where this is where you have cards still in your yard. People can take those into their hand uh, on your turn. Then you also want to play cards. And what's cool about this is you play cards. They have symbols on them. And it's important because this is going to kind of fuel your engine and some of the actions that you're doing. And people, if they have a matching symbol to that card, can follow you. Yes, they can follow and take the action you're taking. Now, not to the magnitude that you're taking it, but they can get a little piece of the action, like collecting some pizza or be able to move some things on their board. So uh, there are other things in the game that are really fun, like perk cards, which give you bonus abilities throughout the games, uh, made up rule cards, which is super thematic in the name and these are end game scoring things that uh, obviously will get you points in the game and the game which we learned the hard way you want to try and accumulate points quickly so people don't have a long time to catch up to you so when you get your fort to a certain level or you reach a certain number of points uh, on the board I think it's 25 points and that 25, will yeah. yeah through end the game for you and I think uh, if somebody reaches I think it's the end of your fort level you get the is it the macaroni the trophy? macaroni sculpture <laughs> yeah. sculpture that's it so hey you- macaroni <laughs> I fact. Oh my goodness. So that's always a fun thing. So, uh, and then obviously most points wins the game. Let's just spoiler alert. I love this game. I think I've played it online like 10 times now. It's yeah. so fun. I do have the physical copy. I obviously can't play it solo. So it comes in a really nice small box and the components. What? Have you felt the components for this, Tom, Suzanne? Oh yeah. I, I haven't seen it yet, but it, they <gasps> look good. Oh my god! No, the cards are like that plastic esque kind of feel. So you know, you could just shuffle them. You know that like what, bridge shuffle, and they're not going to get ruined. They're just so sturdy, and the boards are like that strong cardboard. Oh, I was very yeah. They're double layered boards that fit your uh, your little pizza and toy tokens really nicely. Everything has a place where it belongs. Uh, the component quality, I was very impressed with. Yeah, I very very nice. So that that alone, just I was squeeing with glee Woo, so good and i feel i feel like it had some like race for the galaxy vibes now nowhere near complexity let's throw that out there but you know with the whole symbols because all the cards have these different symbols and icons that you're trying to you know get runs with or try to work off of each other i found that was kind of similar and there's a lot of iconography but as the game progresses you will pick it up and they have a player aid which i appreciate that lists all of the different actions that you can take with the symbols and the cards so that i thought was fantastic Uh, i mentioned it earlier don't do what we did in the first game we took a long time i feel to get points when you have that fort work on getting that fort up there you know what i mean things that are 
Right. <laughs> Suzanne's head's kind of going, ah. but I know since I've been working it, you can't ignore the fort. Come on. You have to admit that you do I have can't to put- ignore it, but right. I've, I, similar to you, Mandy, I've played so many games of this now that I've seen a number of different approaches. Sure. And I have definitely been in games where people who did not finish their fort still won the game. And but yeah, just, you have to, you're, you're right. I would think it would be very difficult to win if you never leveled up your fort at all. For, right. For I think sure, you, I agree. You have to work on it to some point is, I guess, more or less what I'm trying to get to. But yes. you don't want to extend the game because then you're, I find you're opening it up for other people to kind of swoop in and win. I found that's what happened with a lot of our games. A lot of people were like, oh, I'll just, you know, build, take their time building things up. And I find that doesn't always go well. I could be wrong, but in the games I've played, that's kind of how it happened. But if I don't find it an overly lengthy game, but I do find that first game may take some time because you're just trying to get acquainted with symbols and how the game works and the system that you're trying to go for. So overall, Ford for me was a winner. Love, love, love. I have not gotten tired of it yet, and I look forward to playing it again. I'm really looking forward to trying this one out. I think you'll like it, Todd. It's a complete package. And you, Mandy, you said Race for the Galaxy. I think other people who've played Glory for Rome may mm-hmm. have a little hint of a vibe there as well. And... I'm just so impressed. And I also want to, I think it's just one of those games you have to acknowledge the art and the setting and the theme and how it takes a mechanically solid experience and just up levels it to just deep enjoyment. The art is phenomenal. It fits the theme of kids building a fort so well. This was a a really delight. And Tom, I'm very excited to see what you think of it. Mm -hmm. Me too. I'm looking forward to it. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't disliked anything from Leader Games yet. So, you know, this one is was a bit of a surprise because I know everyone's like super pumped about Oath, right? And then Fort came out, and I was like, oh, oh well, that sounds interesting. So, I just haven't. I've seen it all over the internet, and I have not seen hide or hair of it. But I'm sure it will show up eventually. Yes, eventually. There you go, Fort. A quick game for me coming out from Haba Games. And it's interesting. I'm kind of sad. And Tom, you you still have your littlest ones, but I, my kids are starting to age out of some of the younger kid games a little bit, and they want to explore more grown up or more family level games. And I'm a little sad because I'm starting to see Haba games that I think look adorable, but I go, mm, I don't know if my kids want to play that anymore. Oh wow! I thought you would. That's fantastic. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, I, then I, it's kind of like. I was glad when I had kids because then I could go see all the kid movies with not even a shred of... Oh, oh, I see, I see, I see. (laughs) But uh, this one, I think, is much more general and has a much broader appeal. That is Fiverr Findin'. And that's Fiverr with the number five E-R. Fiverr Findin' is actually a game I picked up at the Spiel last year, but then it's finally coming out to the North American market now it's designed by Jurgen Grinow and I think it's going to retail for around $20, $25, somewhere in there. Basically it is a roll and write game. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> Surprise. No one is surprised. Right. <laughs> exactly. And this one has, you get five custom dice that have different icons on them and the icons are a color too. So the blue You know, there's a blue diamond and then there's a yellow flower. And I think that's just to help with color blindness and with pattern recognition, because this is definitely a pattern recognition game. Everybody's going to get their own player board and the component quality is very, very nice. These are very sturdy, dry erase boards that are double sided. And the board itself is just a grid of tons of these icons in what looks like a random scattering all around the board. What's going to happen? is the dice are going to get rolled, and then everybody is trying to find that cluster of dice in as many places on their board as they can. And you just use the dry erase pen to outline them. So ultimately, you're drawing polyominoes or tetrominoes around these shapes. And when somebody says, oh, I think I found all I can, they can turn a timer, and then that's what everybody else has to do any last minute finds and there's scoring based on the shapes that you find. So the different shaped Tetris pieces have different points depending on uh, what you find on your board. There's also a, what they call puzzle play option where the dice are rolled. Everybody finds one shape or tries to find one shape on their board that matches that dice pattern. And then 
another die roll and then you keep on doing that. But each shape itself, there's a little board that keeps track of it, can only be drawn once. And I like the game. I really like the puzzle play. I actually prefer the puzzle play mode over the regular game because Mm -hmm. early, eh, it's no big deal. You're just playing the game. But mid to late game, it actually gets super tight and a little bit harder because you're limited to the shapes you can draw. So then your brain is really scrambling to find, oh, where's two purple flowers, a triangle, a diamond, you know, all together. Oh, no, I found it, but it's in the wrong shape. I got to keep on looking. I like the extra tension that the puzzle play brought to the mid and late game of the play in Fiverr Find It. But overall, rule set, very, very simple. Age range, you can play it with virtually any age. You can play this with very young children, I feel. Now, will they be as competitive? Maybe, maybe not. Although I do find kids are shockingly good at pattern finding and pattern recognition. So I wouldn't underestimate the little ones on this one. I really enjoyed it. I had fun with it. I like that puzzle play. And I think it's a nice pickup for families that are looking for a game to play at home right now. Fiverr finding. Uh, Random thing here. It has nothing to do with the game, but it just made me laugh. Fiverr, not a weird word in Canada because, you know, you have a Fiverr, like a $5 bill. So just throwing that out there in case anyone thought that was weird. Sure, but I don't think you spell it 5-E-R. How do you know, Tom? (laughs) Are you Canadian, Tom? That's why I said, I don't think. No, you don't. <laughs> you spell it with an O-U-R at the end, right? It's five or. <laughs> oh, no. All right. Let's talk about a game that probably no one's heard of at all, and that's Aqua Mirabilis. This is from Gotha Games. Um, I believe I've only played one other Gotha game. That's Expo 1906. Hmm. Although, well, I think I played their Race Formula 90 also, but... This game is one that interested me because I like the theme of it, and that's making of perfumes, which has been done a few times in the past, but not tremendously well. Uh, And in this one, it's in the time of the Court of Versailles, where mostly perfumes are pretty important, since (laughs) if you didn't use them, uh, it was pretty bad. They were basically covering up horrific scents with these. But that's what you are. You're a perfumer, and you're putting together different – you're cross – putting scents together. So I might have orange and jasmine, and I put those together and make this orange jasmine perfume that different people will want. And there's this really cool grid on the board where if you're the first to make a certain combination, you'll get bonuses and such. And But the king, he always tries, he's looking for something new. So the mm-hmm. king's in one of the columns on this grid, and he's looking for the, the, the scent that's used the least. While his court is in the, the rose, they always want the scent that's used the most because they're, they're, they're they trying want, to be yeah, trendy. This popular. Yeah. yeah, this is popular. And I like that because that's thematic, but it's also interesting. You know, Are you going to sell something that there's a lot of because the court will give you the bonus or will you try to be more unique and do it to the king? Other than that, it's a worker placement game. And so you have to go collect the flowers at the flower stand and then use different methods to change those flowers into scents, then combine those scents into... Uh, perfumes to do for the king. It's a really solid worker placement game. I would say 90 minutes to two hours. It's on, uh, it's not, I wouldn't call it a light game by any means, but it's not Mm. that complex and the theming really helps. Uh, The pieces are pretty cool. Um, It's not like amazing, but they're they're solid for what it is. And I don't know. I, again, part of it's because I enjoy the theme so much, but I also think the mechanisms back it up. Mm -hmm. So that's Aqua Mirabilis from Gotha games. I've heard of this. Uh, is it new? It, I believe, was released at Essen 2019. Okay, because it's definitely Amongst familiar. 7,000 other games. <laughs> well, this is it, right? This is it. This is rather interesting. It sounds, this is something that I definitely would be interested in playing. And I'm also curious, did they have the ingredient vetiver in the game by any chance? Uh, they have orange, bergamot, I don't even know what that is, jasmine, <laughs> lavender, Narcissus and Rose. Okay. Well, still nice ones. I was just curious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, Mandy. I know fragrances. What can I say? I know Tom, fragrances. have you heard any rumors about this getting picked up for a broader distribution? Or is it one of those ones I that haven't. you have to go dig it mm. out? You may have to, unfortunately, because I don't know that any of the Gotha games have ever been picked up. Oh, okay. Hmm. Um, 
And when I look up Board Game Geek, someone says, will this be available? But that was nine months ago. Oh. <laughs> so maybe. I think nice. you can get it. You may be able to get it through their website, Gotha. Uh, so look up Gotha. That's G-O-T-H-A, Gotha Games. Uh, Mandy's going there right now. Right I right am. Well, unfortunately, I have a gamer keyboard, so it's very clickety-clack. So I will do that after the recording of this podcast. <laughs> And now let's look at the digital side of board gaming with Tap That App. Okay, everyone. It, I feel like it's been a while since I've talked about an app. It's Suzanne. She brings all the apps to the table and I sit there and go, mm-hmm. oh, that's wonderful. Can I add this to my collection? Oh, <laughs> well, I have one this week. Okay, so yay. Yay for me. Lost Cities. <sighs> that's the crowd going wild. <sighs> <laughs> That's my attempt, anyway. <laughs> really? It sounded like you were just huffing into the microphone. <laughs> okay, this is as bad as my charades thing, where, anyway, potion explosion, you need to watch the video. Apparently, that was really bad, too. <laughs> so, moving on. Uh, Lost Cities was designed by the Coding Monkeys, and they also did another one. Was it Carcassonne? They did another one that I really liked, Suzanne. Do you remember the Coding Right, it's not designed by, it's developed by. Developed, excuse me. Yes, and I think yes. they did that one as well, the version that I really like. So, happy to see that. So, Lost Cities I have reviewed before. It's a fairly simple game. And basically, you're playing against a friend. You have these, I guess, in the app, you have these columns, and they're you're trying to reduce the negative value of them by placing cards into it. And they have certain ones that have, like, a money symbol on them that kind of doubles your score, but it also doubles the negative value that you have to bring down. And um, apparently I'm very bad at this game, even when I'm playing against the easy AI, but there you have it. And I think the game ends when you run out of cards in the deck, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to finish the game. Yes. Yes, I think that's what it is. Exactly. So I just got the app maybe a week or so ago, and I got it on iOS versus the Android because I wanted to see what it looked like on the bigger screen. It's weird. It doesn't fill up the screen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't that's because it's an older app that I... Some of these older apps only were for iPhone, and you just have to make them bigger to go to the iPad. Okay, right. and I, that's what I thought. Like, maybe did I download the iPhone version? But yeah, that makes sense what you're saying. So it's, it gets bigger. It doesn't fill the entire screen, but big enough that you can see it. I mean, it, you're right. It's an older app. You can notice that for the most part, but it's not a bad thing necessarily. It's very straightforward, simple. I ran through the tutorial just to see how it was, and... I mean, it guides you through it. It's not a hard game, and it was pretty straightforward. I could follow it easily, and I purposely didn't reread the rules just to see how it would navigate, and I thought it was it was good for what it was. Does it have fancy graphics or anything amazing? No. no. <laughs> yeah, literally, no. <laughs> but for what it is, it's fine. So if you are expecting a light show and something spectacular, you're not going to get it here, but if you like the game, it does what it's supposed to do. So I like the game. The app for me was fine. And again, it's old. It's old. That's, that's what it, it is. And that's exactly it. It's just old. I think sure if they did like a quick revamp with it, and I'm not saying fancy lights and a light show here, but just, you know, little tweaks to make it look a bit more modern. And I think it would be really good. So Lost Cities, I love the game. The app for me was it, was, it was okay. It was fine. Tom, how many games of Lost Cities do you think you've played in your life? Uh, I, you know... I found that human beings tend to exaggerate, myself included. You'll be like, I played that game 80 times. But if you kept track, it's probably not as many. Right. So I'll say 50. I don't know. I, I know that when I first played it, back when it first came out, me and my wife played it all the time. It's been a while. I like Maybe the last time I played it was last year. Well, actually, this year I played the, the app version. Uh, <laughs> I love the game. I thought the app had some neat things in it. It keeps track of everything for mm -hmm. you. But it, it, it is very, very basic. Right. Like, it's not a pretty app. Right. It, which I think is as much a reflection of its age mm -hmm. sure. more than anything else. Sure, absolutely. I have been playing some board game apps. I'll, I'll be honest, there's a couple that are in beta that I'm not sure I'm allowed to talk about, so I'm not going to. But with our foray into talking about things like Griftlands and some kind of board game adjacent games, I mm -hmm. figured I'd highlight a game called Dicey. Dungeons. Ooh. Dicey Dungeons is, well, let's put it this way. If you are a fan of a game like Slay the Spire, you might want to check out Dicey Dungeons. And now, Mandy, I know I have your attention. Yes, you darn right you do. <laughs> Dicey Dungeons is kind of structurally, you, you're going in there, you get a character. And then you're going to take this character on a journey through 
different little micro battles against different enemies to try to beat a big boss. Similar to a game like Slay the Spire or Monster Train, there's a little map of the enemies in front of you. And you have a little bit, a little bit of choice of which enemy you take on. And then there's locations on the map where you can get power ups or buy new abilities or upgrades and things like that. Ultimately, what happens is that you 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 enter into a room with an enemy, and here's where it's it gets a little more interesting. Basically, you're going to have a set of skills, and you use dice to activate those skills. And the skills will have a ton of different – there's just a really wide range of them. So maybe a skill will apply poison, or maybe a skill says you can put at most a four on the skill to activate it, at most a four die – but then it does double damage or this one will freeze an opponent's die or this one will compound and build up on your next turn. There's a really wide variety of skills that you can power up with dice. You can build up your pool of dice as you go. And it's a very, very simple game. And I think that that's one of its appeals to me. So you're just kind of knocking out these enemies, trying to work your way up to the big boss. Hopefully you've built up your character enough that by the time you get to the big boss, you can defeat it. Bob's your uncle, you win. Yay! Where I think this game shines is that there are at least five different characters, if not six, and they all play very, very differently. And I love that. So you have your basic character where you're just going to have those different skills that I talked about. You roll some dice, you activate it, you get maybe your special skills, you get a reroll. But then there's one where it's like a robot. And in order to really maximize, you have to roll your pool of dice and try to hit a target range on this cumulative point value scale. There's one that uses spells and you have to allocate dice to certain spells and you can assign spells to different die values and things like that. The variety in how these cute little dice figures, which Tom, we might have to talk to him because we all know Dice Tower has the trademark on dice people, right? Come on. Well, I think so. I've tried. <laughs> I think we have like 50 or so now. It's, they're it's so great. But yeah, they're these little dice that have different characteristics to it. So ultimately, Dicey Dungeons is a very simple game. It's not super deep, but it has just enough interest with the kind of the diversity of how the different characters play out that it's worth exploring and delving into. And I've really enjoyed that. If I have one complaint, it's that it's... It's always planning ahead, but when the enemies attack you back, there's not a lot you can do in reaction. You just have to have made really smart plays the turn before to kind of weaken them. It is what it is for such a light game. Who cares? But I think it's not a board game, but it's one of those games that as a board gamer, I think there are elements to it that just really appeal to the things I like about analog games, including the use of dice as a core mechanism, right? And that, oh, the holding your breath, I really need a three, I really need a three, and you don't get the three, and then you yell at your computer and your dog starts barking and all that kind of thing. I feel like that's a very specific situation that has occurred. (laughs) (laughs) It's totally made up off the top of my head. So that's Dicey Dungeons. It's a game you might want to check out. It's on Steam. It's coming out for mobile in the future, but definitely worth a look. Oh, I know it's on Steam because I've pulled it up right now on my phone. And just wait for it. Similar to games you've played, Monster Train, and Griftlands. So there you go. So now I need to have it. (laughs) Well, at the very beginning of that, Suzanne said that if you like Slay the Spire, and y'all have been raving about Slay the Spire. Everyone's been (laughs) raving about it. I started playing apps, and everyone's like, get Slay the Spire. I said, I'll get it. How can you slay a spire? I have now since found that you actually do. (laughs) Literally (laughs) slay the spire. I thought that was kind of like some sort of, you know... Metaphor. Metaphor. It's not a metaphor. You're like literally, uh, whatever. It's a deck building (laughs) game. I don't want to get into it because I'm sure you've all talked about this on the show before. It is a deck building game in which you take one of four different characters who are extremely different and have unique abilities. And you fight uh, like very similar to many JRPGs. And you play cards and attack. They will attack you back. You try to avoid their damage. You try to use special abilities. You consistently, as you fight enemies... Get more cards you can add to your deck. You can upgrade your cards, make them better, get special artifacts that make it better until you eventually hopefully beat one of three different bosses in a row and then you can uh, slay the spire and then start over again and do it over and over and over again. That's the way the game is meant to be. It has all kinds of weird challenges. So, uh, yeah, this, this one, it, it's okay. 
Oh. I'm lying. This is the most addictive <laughs> game I've ever played like, <laughs> in 2019 to 2020. You got um, me. <laughs> in fact, you got I'm, me. You got me, Tom. You did. <laughs> I want this recording to end so that I may continue <laughs> my game that I'm currently playing with the defect. Uh, what is there's crack in this game? I don't know what it is. I I am staying up late at night when I should be going to bed. I wake. I dreamed about the game. It's, <laughs> it's like, really, really good. And I like think cool. what it is, is the game you just keep getting cooler and better. Yeah. Yes, eventually you'll get to an enemy who just smacks you down. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess you could beat the game too. And then you start over again. But you just, you have eventually this, this weird, awesome combo and all these artifacts that do these crazy things. And there will be moments where you'll play a card and you'll watch some amazing thing happen on the screen. Uh, not the animation. The animation's kind of bleh. But <laughs> everything but just kind cares? of slouches around. Or like, uh, I'm looking at you angrily. <laughs> <laughs> but it is so good. So good. So I'm probably going to delete play it, it from my iPad soon. <laughs> because I'm so glad you're enjoying it. Yes. And it's everywhere. You can get it on any... Po- like, I have it on Xbox, Nintendo Switch, Steam. I have it everywhere. It's great. How much money have you given this company, Mandy? Well, Holy cow. Uh, let's be fair now. On Xbox, it's part of the uh, Game Pass, so that one was a freebie, but I did pay for the others. <laughs> yeah, I play with it on the iPad. My only question... My only problem is, I, on the iPad, once in a great while, I will press a card. They'll be like, yeah. which card would you like to get rid of? And I, I touch a card saying, is it that one? And they're like, yes, thank you. I'm like, <laughs> No! <laughs> Not oh, it's too late. I hate you. <laughs> All right, Tom. Who's your favorite character? I don't know. You know. Okay, so now that I played all four extensively, <laughs> extensively, <laughs> um, it's not the first one. The first one just go fight the Ironclad. He's he's cool, and in fact, I'm, it's, it's, it's there's a reason he's the first one. I think it's the I think it's the defect. I like I juggling six hundred different balls and throwing them at the enemies and Actually. doing weird combos with that. It's so that good. But I also love poison. <laughs> yeah. And I also love uh, what's it called? Pressure the rage, points. The watcher. Yeah. Oh, the the watcher is the hardest one to play. That jumping yeah. in and raging out of calm. Every yeah. once in a while, I'm like, oh, I should have like kept my cool. Right. Oh, I've learned a life lesson from a board. <laughs> <laughs> so much context needed. <laughs> if you like. If you like collect, uh, deck building at all, and you also like games like Final Fantasy, mm-hmm. things like that, this is really what that is. It is, it's tremendous. And, and f- per value, mm-hmm. they, don't keep, they don't keep asking me for stuff. I don't have to watch a commercial every time I go up another level. Yep, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> so that's Slay the Spire, which I like. 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. <laughs> You had me there at the beginning. So glad you love it. So good. So good. Order up. And now it's time to order up a slice of game pie. It's game pie time, folks. Time for another big serving of some of our favorite games in a random category. And today, I mean, in honor of Mr. Vassal. This doesn't feel random. (laughs) <laughs> planned <laughs> so you know I'm, I'm almost out of ice cream toppings Wait, uh, what uh, well, well here's what happened uh-huh. right before the uh back in march uh our church was gonna have an ice cream social and i said don't worry i'll handle ice cream toppings and i went <laughs> on amazon and to stores everywhere and prepared ice cream toppings for like 50 to 100 people and then they said we're gonna cancel church forever or I don't know how long, but some feels like that. And I was like, well, I have all these ice cream toppings. Fine. We'll have ice cream night at home. And then next week again, and we've been continually having it to the point where if you said, Tom, do an ice cream, I'd be like, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty dire. I know. (laughs) Too much ice cream (laughs) toppings. Wow. Words I thought I'd never hear anybody say ever. Oh, well, I didn't say no. Seriously. Just, just to be okay. clear, I haven't been saying no. <laughs> okay. I'm saying okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and in case you couldn't guess, today's game pie is all about our favorite games that feature desserts. Oh, this is called game pie. Sorry, I was getting confused there. 
You don't change the name. It's always Game Pie. This it's is just that's Game Pie. Like this is Game Pie Pie. So yes, it's like a play on pie. You know, pie is like three. We had to make it happen, dot, Tom. Dot, dot. Got and it. then there's pie. Yeah. Got it. Slice a game. I pie. didn't celebrate Pie Day this year. <laughs> oh, that's that's a travesty. a travesty. Yes. Yo, Tom. As you, of course, know, since you're an avid listener of all of our episodes and can believe pay attention to everything <laughs> we say. Ah, sorry. Game Pie is our segment in which we take three-ish games in a category and talk about them. And we don't like to rank things. We're not as good as it at it as you and Eric are. So Game Pie is just a lovely serving of some games in a random or semi-random category. Mandy, talk to me about a dessert game. Well, before I start, you did not say the line of my dream. So I will say it. I even wrote it out and you skipped right on by. So I am going to do it. Okay, here we go. I scream. You scream. We all scream for ice cream. Ice cream. cream. Yeah. yeah. See, Thomas. That's why in you it. don't let me intro segments, yeah. Mandy. Where were you, Suzanne? You missed out. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. Let me jump right in. So the first one on my list, doesn't mean it's number one, let's just make that clear, is Rocky Road a la mode. All so, right, ice cream. Right? Right into the ice cream. And I feel like all my games are going to have a theme here with like, uh, with completing orders of something, whether it's ice cream or cake or donuts or something to that effect. Um, I think I just like this game because it's really compact. Played it with my coworkers. They love it. And it's about ice cream. It's small. And, and these kinds of games I find are really cute when it's a small game. So Rocky Road a la mode. Played quite a bit with the colleagues at lunch. It's a good one. It is good. Very good little little pickup and delivery game. I like it a lot. Yeah, it's really good. Similar to the last game pie in which we talked about polyomino games, I went ahead and kind of sub-sliced my pie. Oh, dear. And I'm going to be focusing on games that you may have trouble <laughs> getting, so my apologies. But I'm picking <laughs> games all out of Japan and Taiwan uh, with dessert themes. And first up for me is Moon Cake Master. Hmm. Mo- Moon Cake Master is a game all about creating delicious, tasty moon cakes for your very finicky customers. You get a beautiful box full of very high quality tiles with different wedges. Imagine a, a moon cake and just carved into four pieces. The wedges have different features on them, like uh, hazelnuts or sunflower seeds or egg yolk or traditional elements of moon cakes and they're different colors. And you're going to draft these tiles and ultimately try to make moon cakes that score well individually, but also try to meet the random customer demands that are on display for that round. One of the things I really like about Moon Cake Master is the way that you draft these tiles. You're going to draw three. You pick one to keep, and then you pick one to give to your neighbor on the left, and you pick one to give to your neighbor on the right. And I really enjoy that drafting thing. I will say it does mean the game can get mm, just a little bit mean once in a while because denial is a thing in this game that's very, very strong. But I like the simplicity of the draft. I love the theme. Everything looks so pretty when you're all done. And I think that the nice balance of creating mooncakes that score well on themselves as well as meeting the customer demand works very, very well. So that is Mooncake Master. It's also designed by Daryl Chow. And Mandy, you would know this because Daryl is one of the co-designers of Remember Our Trip, that Sashi mm-hmm. and Sashi game. Yeah, just looked really good. All right. I'm going to start with my first pie entry is Piece of Pie. <laughs> you did um, good, Tom. You quite did literal, good. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually a new game that just came out from Blue Orange, I believe, in which... It's it's similar to another game, which will be mentioned soon, uh, but it's uh, you essentially have a, a, a pie and people are drafting pieces from this pie. So first person takes a piece out, then you take one that was next to that piece, and you're building another pie in front of you, and you score points. You have like a secret goal, like I might secretly want strawberries. I mean, after about three turns, it's not so secret anymore, right? Um, but there's other things that you score for on the pies. They have different uh, features that if you get these two things, and there's some end goals, and the end goals will change from game to game. So uh, that's it. It's pretty. It's simple. Kids can easily play it, but I enjoyed it also. Nice family game, piece of pie. 
So I'm deviating from the pie lane. Yes, I know. We may come back down that road another time, but I'm all about the donuts now. So Donut drive through is on my list. This is another small game. And again, I seem to have this theme about creating orders or completing different types of, you know, donuts that you need to acquire. And it is a card game, much like Rocky Road a la mode. And I, this one, I think, is Grail Games. I might be wrong on that one. I'm pretty sure it's Grail Games. So, yep. yes, okay, that's what I thought. And I know this one I had wanted for a little while because, again, it's a nice one that I can play with colleagues and it's an easy one to teach and understand. So, again, a game about, you know, completing orders and completing objectives to get those wonderful, fancy, delicious donuts in your tummy. Well, I, I'm hoping that's what it is, but it really is about points. But is it getting in your tummy about points? Anyway, I'm going when with it that. When comes to donuts, yes. Exactly. So, donut, drive through another fun, light... Uh, well, dessert-themed game that I enjoy. Are donuts dessert, Tom? Donuts are dessert. In fact, when I was a child, I once asked to have donuts for my birthday instead of cake, which at the time I thought was pretty clever. And now I think my mom was probably like, yes, so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> Next slice from me is a game called Cake Duel. Cake Duel is a two-player game that is basically a bluffing game and you're sheep fighting over cake. And that's a theme alone that will sell me on a game pretty much every darn time. In Cake Duel, you have cards. And I think it's, if you've played Cockroach Poker, it's one of those games where you can put two cards down and go, mm, I've got two archers, right? Because you're sheep archers trying to steal other people's cake. It makes right. sense. Uh, you go, I have two archers. And then your opponent can go, mm, well, I have two defenders. Well, you could be lying about having two archers. Maybe you didn't put down two archers. Maybe you put down a wizard and a wolf. I don't know. Right? <laughs> and so it's got this – it's it's pure bluffing. So reading your opponent is really, really tight. I think uh, Coup, if you've played Coup, uh -huh. which is a little small card game, it's similar to that as well, but just for two players. And it's balanced for two players. And it works well for two players players which i think is awesome it's super duper quick to play like just back and forth back and forth around can be over lickety split so it's it's one of those games you just throw down before you have dinner if you want to knock out a quick two-player game it's adorable it's fun especially when you're playing with somebody that you're trying to have that kind of reading each other tension mm -hmm. and your sheep fighting over cake you can't go wrong yeah. that's cake duel it's a really good little game I like it. Yeah, see? Tom agrees. I got to be right. Well, no. <laughs> um, now I got one from the same company who made Rocky Road a la mode, and that's filler. filler I guess yeah. green couch games just likes uh -huh. dessert. Filler, you are making pastries and fillers, and it's a, it's a card game uh, similar to like Concordia, although it's much lighter than that, where you play cards in your turn until you don't have any more cards to play, and you're going to be kind of picking them up. And each turn you're playing a card that you can... Uh, that says what time in the morning you wake up and earlier is better. But when you, whatever card you play for the time you wake up, you can't use it as ingredients and things like that to make these things. And you're getting all these cool cards in this game, but you can sometimes forget some of the cards are worth points and you probably should get those. So it's so almost as a deck builder feel to it, but right. it's very, very light. I'm not a huge fan of the name of the game because they're trying to be mm. cute. It's like it's about making filler desserts, but also it's a filler game. Ha ha. <laughs> anyway, it's still very fun, and I love the art in it. Filler. So it's kind of like game pie, what we did. Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, the next. Oh, I'm, I, I'm not making fun of names there. I, I was talking about filler specifically, and no other names. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> So the next game to talk about is not a small game, actually. It's called Chocolate Factory. I would have put this on my list. This is such a good game. It was so good. I was, you know, I thought it was going to be something light and I started playing it. And big mistake, we started playing it at like eight o'clock at night. And I'm like, oh, that was not wise because it actually has some weight to it. And it's literally like the name says, right? You're trying to get these treats and you're, you built your factory and you're trying to get your treats and chocolates through the conveyor belt through the factory to complete orders and you want to sell them to the different department stores in order to get money or points in this particular game. I really liked it. I honest to goodness didn't think I was going to like it. I was like, oh, I don't know. Anything about desserts usually is light. They're trying to make this into a heavier game. Mm, don't know if it's going to work. It totally works. 
I really like the decisions you have to make with the types of machinery you're going to try and use in your factory to create your candies or chocolate. Because if you don't have them in the right place or the right types of machine, it either is too expensive, you're not going to have enough to run them, and you're just not going to be able to produce, which is what you need to do to fulfill your orders. So Chocolate Factory, I think, was published by Alley Cat Games, if I'm not mistaken. It's one I still have, and I had mine signed by the designers. So special. So... Chocolate Factory is one I think you should try it if you want something that's sweet with a little bit of heavy. (laughs) All desserts are heavy. That's true. (laughs) I don't care what they say. They'll be like, I like dessert. Nope. No, this isn't. (laughs) This is definitely a heavy dessert. (laughs) A wafer thin mint. I want to talk about a game called Sweet Stack. This is a card-based roll and write game. And it's got polyominoes in it. It's very much in that kind of Tetris roll and write game family, but the thematically it's candy and what's going to happen trick or treating kind of thematically. So everybody gets a sheet and you're going to get dealt out a hand of cards. The cards have polyominoes on them and you are going to play a card that will give you hopefully a little bit of benefit, but you're actually playing the card on your neighbor and then that is what your neighbor has to fill into their sheet. And you similarly have to fill in the shape that your neighbor gave you. So, oh yeah, there's some tension in this game. Ultimately, you're filling your sheet just like you would in a game of Tetris from the bottom up. Polyominoes will quote unquote fall down the sheet and then uh, you can use tokens that you can earn to rotate the shape a little bit, things like that. But those tokens really come into play. It's a very, very simple game, but it works quite well. I think the idea of giving your opponent what they play calls back to a game I very much enjoy called Quarto, where you're giving your opponent the piece that they get to play, which adds just a different level of tension and a different way that you're paying attention to what your opponent is doing, which I really personally enjoy. There's some interesting scoring. If you fill in a complete row, you're going to be marking off uh, a favorite candy And then you will score bonus points based on how many cards you manage to play with your favorite candy on it. One weird thing about Sweet Stack is that you technically play three rounds and each round you start with a new sheet. So when you sit down to play Sweet Stack, everybody gets three score sheets. I don't think I've seen that in another Roll and Write game. Well, you better laminate them at that point. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. No, and I did. Absolutely, 100%. You got to laminate these (laughs) and use like colored markers and things like that. But Sweet Stack... It's an interesting take on kind of that Tetris style roll and write game. I really enjoy it. And it's got that wonderful candy theme. If you're listening to this, this one's a hard one to search for. It's Sweets Stack. Oh. So it's two different words. Um, I looked up Sweet Stack and I couldn't find it. Oh, sorry, Tom. Oh, no, no worries. It's uh, tricky. These, and, and you yeah. know me, stick with for pronunciation and spelling. My <laughs> next one is Just Desserts. Now, this is by far, of all the games we're talking about, it's the lightest game on the list. Yeah. Yes. It's really, really light um, from, the, from Looney Labs, and they make, that's what they do. They make really light games, and it's just about playing desserts and collecting them and, you know, seeing what happens. You're, you're trying to play the right desserts for the right people. Each dessert has different characteristics. I, I don't know. I still like it. I think part of it is the fact that every card in this game is a different dessert. And just even looking at the pictures now, I'm thinking supper's really close. And after (laughs) supper, I hope there's a dessert. There probably isn't, though, because my wife says no. But uh, maybe if she's not looking pie, I know where. Okay, so I'm 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 getting totally off subject here. Just desserts, a fun, light little game from Looney Lab. John, do you have the bacon expansion for it? I don't, because I am actually opposed to bacon in desserts. Oh, really? Because once when I went to Origins back when conventions hmm. were open, um, there was a place there that they had a chocolate bacon dessert, and I said, "I've heard about this. I'll try it." And it tasted like chocolate and bacon. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "All right, cool," but I don't get why that combo exists. This, I had the same reaction though to chicken and waffles. Um, I had, waffles I had chicken and waffles, and I was like, "Okay." I had chicken and waffles, but it wasn't like putting them together suddenly created this heavenly combo. It was chicken and waffles. No. A good weird combo is apple pie with a slice of sharp cheddar cheese melted on top. That I agree with you, but apples and cheese are a good combo, period. 
very good combo. It See, is. Suzanne? See? You should eat I'm that. not arguing with you on that one. You take a, a bite out of some nice sharp cheddar and then a slice of apple. It is... Mm, so good. Right. Granny Smith apples specifically. Yes. Right. Oh, see? Agreed. Oh. Okay. Whew, now I want to go have some. All oh, right. dear goodness. <laughs> I got really excited there. Uh, so the last game I'm going to talk about is Piece O' Cake. And I think it was re-implemented as a New York Slice, if I'm not mistaken. And I think that was put out That's by... That's a pizza game, though, not dessert. I know, but I'm talking about the... The, the dessert one. So I think Bezier Games put out New York Slice, I believe. I don't know if they put out the original. I'm assuming they did. No, the original was a, a little small one from uh, Europe, I believe. And it's one of those um, split choose, I split you yep. choose type of games. And well, well, it has desserts. And I mean, I want to choose them all, but I can't. So it's up to someone to, you know, split it out for you to take the pieces. And well, you know, you're not always ending up with the things that you want. And then based on the types of things that are on the cake or, you know, the dessert that you're choosing can help you garner points for sets, collections, that sort of thing. So, piece of cake. Well, I liked it in the games. Piece of cake. <laughs> okay, that was terrible. Uh, but you can play a lot of people with this game, which is always fun. And I haven't had anybody that I've played with that disliked it. So everyone I've played it with really enjoyed it and obviously enjoyed the pizza version as well. So, piece of cake is delightful. And I... I, call, I don't know if it's called cheating or it what is. have you, but basically... <laughs> Just to clarify, it is. I didn't want you to be confused. <laughs> Let's okay. put it out there. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the clarity on that. But I am saying the Piso games, not pizza games, the Piece O games, both of which made this pie already. But Piece O Cake and Piece of Pie are both delightful dessert games. And I think. Any game collection that needs dessert games would be well served by pieces of cake and pieces of pie. Oh, and just so you all can't see this, but I can. And in capital letters, ha ha ha, I cheat here. Booyah. Just, just so you in know. The, she's, in the show. Uh, yeah, yeah very know. aware that she cheated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this isn't like, okay, that's fine. All right. My number four, which I worked to put on and not copying others, is Baker's Dozen. This is actually kind of a weird one that you might not find on, for example, Board Game Geek because it's called Friday the 13th. And the original game was Poison. Oh, it's, a, it's like a card collection game where you, there's some cards you don't want from Reiner Knizzi, of all people. But oh. in between Poison and Friday the 13th, it was called Baker's Dozen, and it was about collecting donuts. Except some donuts were poisoned, but you don't want oh. those. <laughs> or, or they were moldy or something. They were green. I, uh, that could mean anything. So they were um, Boston creams is what you're telling me. Oh. What? Oh, oh, okay, sorry. Continue. Oh. You don't like Boston cream? Mandy, uh. stop gagging on a podcast. Sorry. I can't. Yeah, come on now. Uh, all right. How about maple? Is maple okay? Oh, keep the she hates maple. Oh, Tom, goodness. she hates maple. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> What kind of donuts do you eat? How about how about uh, Nutella donuts? That's all right, but I much prefer a honey cruller. Light and delicious. That's not even a donut. That's a cruller. All right. Anyhow, well, th- do you like eclairs? No, too creamy. <gasps> why are we, Suzanne, why is she? You were so good. You had, it, you had the apple and cheese thing. You were so good. And you, you lost it, Mandy. <gasps> it's, it's the lactose. Okay. <laughs> Well, you could say that. All right. <laughs> Baker's does it anyway. It's a, it's a fun little game. I like these kind of card collection games where you try to win some cards and not others. And I honestly like the Baker's Dozen theme a lot more than Poison. You know, it just, it just worked for me because well, you're collecting donuts. And also the cards were round, which I thought was fun. There you go, folks. A game pie. I will say, when I was trying to go back through my collection and, and try to figure out what I wanted to put on this list, I realized... There are still, to this day, with all the games that have hit the market in the past 15 years, not enough dessert-themed games on the market. Which makes no sense, because dessert is like a big part of everyone's life. It's very true. So, all y'all game designers, all y'all publishers out there, I I promise you, I've done the research. There's plenty of room for more dessert-themed games in the industry. So, bring it. (laughs) Tom, if you have questions... For us, because you want to talk to us more, do you know that you can email us with questions, just like all the listeners can email us with questions? Oh. And if you want to email us, you can 
reach me at Suzanne at Dicetower.com. And you can reach me at Mandy, that's Mandy with an I, at Dicetower.com. And Tom, where can people reach you if people want to ask you? You can literally put any other word before at Dicetower.com and it will likely come to me. So you could put pie at Dicetower.com. <laughs> And I'll get it. <gasps> that's a challenge. You know, is people that are really do that how now. that works? Oh it's, my gosh, I feel like happen. that's a challenge. I'm <laughs> testing this out. We're ending the podcast. I got to email Tom a bunch of times. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining us on another episode of the Dice Tower Podcast. Tom, thank you so much for joining us yes, today. It's great to have you here. Let me in. As always, everybody. It is a privilege and pleasure to be part of your extended gaming family, and we're so happy that you joined us on today's episode. Next episode is 669, and Tom and Eric are talking about their favorite R games. Or we're going to talk about Slay the Spire, one of those two. <laughs> yeah. I took a the turn. Dice Tower now is Slay the Spire podcast. <laughs> Until next time, I'm Suzanne Sheldon. I'm Mandy Hutchinson. And I'm Tom Vassell. And you've been listening to The Dice Tower. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. Thank you for your continued support. And speaking of support, the Jack Vassal Memorial Fund is an organization dedicated to helping gamers in need. Learn more about the fund's mission and how you can help at jackvassal.org. The Dice Tower is produced by Tom, Suzanne, Mandy and Eric with assistance from Roy Canaday and Rob Searing. Our theme is composed by Timothy Pinkham and arranged by Matt Bellier. Let us know what you think of the show by posting to the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, following the Dice Tower on Twitter, or by emailing us at podcast at Dicetower.com. And don't forget to visit the other shows in the Dice Tower Network at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. All right, it's that time again for Two Truths and a Lie, so I will go first. So my reveal from last episode, I collect fans, I collect pins, and I collect stamps. If you said that I collect stamps was the lie, that would be correct. I do not own a single stamp unless it is on a envelope already licked and, you know, ready to go. <laughs> oh, wow, that was visceral. How many fans do you have, Mandy? Probably counting that are still workable, usable. I think probably about 40. Oh my good gravy. Wow. <laughs> You're very cool lady. Exactly. From last episode, I said I loved the show Knight Rider. I loved the show Battlestar Galactica. And I loved the show Airwolf. And the lie is that I loved Airwolf. I thought helicopters were weird and I was worried they would chop off my head. So oh. I was not a fan. <laughs> that went in a very different direction. <laughs> So new this episode for me, here we go. I still own 100 CDs, I still own 100 cassettes, and I still own 100 records. Hmm. And new for me this episode, when I was a kid, I had a slip and slide, I had a backyard pool, and I had a dozen super soakers. Some good stuff this week. Good luck. <laughs>